Do you want to start a thriving real estate career, but don't know where and how to start? Do you want to become a successful realtor or investor, but lack the required knowledge and skills? Gear yourself up with the best and actionable advice here on The Real Estate Rundown. Tune in as Shannon Robnett talks with industry veterans about all kinds of asset classes, market trends, challenges, management techniques, and success stories. Listen to informative discussions with valuable tips that will serve as the foundation for your incredible real estate venture. Now, here's your host, Shannon Robnett. Hey, everybody. Welcome to season two of the Real Estate Rundown. In this episode, our guest will help me discuss strategies to create a recession-proof real estate portfolio while investing in affordable housing. I know those things don't really sound like they go together, but my guest, Mark Curry, has been a master of that for years. So we're going to jump right into this conversation and see what you can do to follow Mark and whether market conditions, whether they're current, past, present, or future, and have success. So welcome to the show, Mark Curry. How are you, Mark? Thanks, Shannon. Doing great. So Mark, you are the vice president and co-founder of SMC or SMK Capital. I'm looking right behind you and I still can't read. Uh, <laughs> how long have you been in that position? Sure. Yeah. Uh, we started our company 2010 formally, Shannon. So, okay. over 12 years so ago. you're a spring chicken. You're brand new to the game, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You started, you started this process when uh, at the really the bottom of the market or actually on the, still on the downward slide, right? Well, I started investing in 2005 and so uh, kept investing through 2010, uh, just family and myself uh, okay. grouping our capital together. And then 2010, we uh, formally went out, created our company and started expanding so we could uh, partner with others that liked and trusted us as well. So, you know, Mark, that's one of the questions that everybody, uh, you know, there was a there was a time, uh, 2005, six and seven, for those of you kids that weren't there was a very attractive time. Everybody was in real estate, eight, nine, 10, and 11. You were a leper if you were still in it, right? Um, what, what did you, what was your philosophy as you transitioned from the last bull market in real estate, five, six, seven? How did you transition your strategy to eight, nine, 10? And then what, what, are you, what are you seeing similarly, even though this isn't a wait, we all know it's not a wait. What do you see similarly in where we're at now? Yeah, so, some good questions, Shannon. So as far as the transition, you know, we focused heavily on kind of buying distressed properties. A lot of it was all cash, direct from the bank, foreclosures, REOs, short sales. Um, in 2008, you know, my brother and I partnered, we bought a fourplex, it was 75% vacant. We overpaid, we over-renovated, it took so long, you know, we, we learned uh, some, some you know, some powerful lessons from that one uh, deal, but um, we held it for, I don't know, nine, 10 years. And so. So you said a couple of really important things I want to back up and hit right now. You said all cash mm -hmm. and you said held for nine or 10 years mm -hmm. in the current market. Those are two things that nobody does. Sure. Is that why you survived? Uh, I think what we were focusing on to help us survive Shannon was creating value, right? And so we were buying, again, distressed, whether it was financed or not, um, just think about that in general. And we were growing value manually, right? We weren't relying on market appreciation. We were effectuating change by doing a lot of heavy lifting. And so right. a lot of that still applies today where we're not just uh, hoping that the market's going to create our returns. We're right. engineering them in a sense. So that's a, a little bit how we look at it. You know, and, and I think that that is, uh, you know, we, we had a lot of the same conditions in 08 that we had two years ago or 12 months ago. We had easy money. We had lots of it, right, which allowed for higher leverage positions. Obviously, this time we didn't have the, uh, you know, the, the, the exploding uh, negatively amortizing loans, but we still had, you know, low interest rates, which created artificial value, not artificial value. The value was real at that interest rate, but when interest rates changed, uh, people saw equity eroding. Um, in 2008, money was easy, but you still chose to go the all cash route. What was your thought process behind that? 
Yeah, I mean, so obviously the financing markets uh, pretty much dried up for the type of assets that we were targeting, Shannon. So part of our thought process was, was hey, we were able to buy stuff at 50, 60% off what they were selling for just two years ago. Let's go do some of that and let's build a portfolio around it. And um, obviously, if there's no financing readily available or at least attractive financing, you know, we, we still felt that the buy was where we were making our money. And, yep. um, and again, these were heavy lifts, Shannon. We don't focus on that strategy anymore, but we were putting a lot of dollars into them to renovate them, right? And so uh, some of that financing wasn't available either for the, for the renovations. I'm laughing, Mark, because all of us start out with a heavy lift. Yeah. You know, as, as we get older, I believe it's our optimism that erodes. <laughs> <laughs> sure. uh, we've done the heavy lift. Um, you know, we've seen where, I mean, I remember one time I bought a, a 2,300 square foot house for five grand, right? It had to be moved. I don't know that you get a heavier lift than that. Uh, but it was one of the most painful experiences of my life. I got through it, but I think that that's, uh, I think that that says a lot for your investment thesis, your thought process. You know, you were coming in, you were looking at, at manually adding value, you know, we're in the development world for the most part, and we add value by actually assembling the sticks and stones the first time. You came in with your deal, you assembled, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming three quarter vacant, it was because very dilapidated, uh, you know, mismanaged, um, and uh, there was a lot that had to be cleaned up. And and then you you saw that, you know, we can buy this for, what was your first purchase? How much was that three quarter empty fourplex? You know, that one, Shannon, we overpaid, right? So we bought it in 08, which at okay. that time, the market prices hadn't necessarily adjusted in that, in that area. But for the next couple of years, what we were buying predominantly then, again, not what we do today, but uh, it was a lot of uh, single family, small multifamily, um, you know, again, at the courthouse steps, that kind of stuff. So, okay. you know. So then- but, but when you sold that asset, that fourplex, 10 years later, were you profitable? Yeah. See, that's the thing, Mark. You've been in this game since 05, right? You're, 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 you're brand new at this, just like I am, right? And, and Mark, for, for my audience, Mark's 25 years old. Uh, that's just what real estate will do to you, right? No, you're not. But the reality is, if you hold the asset, if you... If you bring enough cash to the table that that it's not something you're going to lose to the bank, uh, that, that way you don't have to worry about guys like Mark picking that up in his early career, but you're going to be able to make money in real estate. Real estate will give you returns if you give real estate the time. But I think a lot of people treat real estate like a, uh, like a stock pick, right? Uh, that, that we're going to buy this, we're going to flip this, and in six months, we're going to get out of it, and we're going to be able to have these things. Um, and so it's refreshing, Mark, to hear that your strategy is, is founded in the best of times, the worst of times, uh, and you, you were doing some of this stuff. Let's fast forward to the last 24 months. What has your company been doing in the last 24 months uh, with the markets that we, that we see again that in, 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 Real estate. Sure. Yeah. I, I'll give you a little bit of a, a background here, Shannon, which I think will help about how we see things today. Um, so in 2018 or so, we stopped focusing on a lot of single family, small multifamily. We really were focusing on recession resistance uh, and, and created a, a fund, a recession resistant fund. We put together mobile home parks, self storage, and uh, apartments into one offering for our investor group. The purpose of that, Shannon, was to uh, weather a storm. We felt there was going to be a correction soon. And so we closed that investment in 2019 to new capital. Uh, everything we were targeting was a five to 10 year hold with value add strategy. And so there's a combination of income and growth as an investor would look at it. Um, and then, of course, COVID hit. We stopped investing entirely for seven months, trying to figure out what was gonna happen. Uh, was there gonna be distress? Are tenants gonna stay in pay? Is occupancy gonna drop? Are, are assets gonna go back to the bank? You name it. And you know that didn't happen. And so we started uh, investing again in Q3 of 2020. We saw, gosh, just a ton of demand 
for from residents and also from investors who we you know sell product to and other equity groups. Um, and so we started investing Shannon in two to three year holds. We were really looking for um, properties we could effectuate change, come and put a lot of dollars into them and renovate them and take advantage of the tailwinds that the market was giving us. And some of those tailwinds, Shannon, as you know, massive rent growth, a lot of uh, cap rate compression, which is valuation growth, you know, natural market appreciation. And when we couple that with manual uh, renovations value add, you are creating a recipe for a really great return. Um, fast forward to earlier this year, 2022, we stopped investing in short-term deals again, and we pivoted back to recession resistance. We're now looking more at cash flowing assets, five to 10 year holds, fixed rate debt. Um, again, not trying to sell at the wrong time, right? If there is a correction of recession, we want to just continue to hold and, uh, and not be forced to, to get out at the wrong time. So Mark, I'm going to ask you a question back to a statement you made earlier that you overpaid in 08. I just heard you mention on three different occasions where it sounds like what happened to you in 08 taught you a couple of lessons that you've employed now on a magnified scale. So can you really stand comfortably behind that statement that you overpaid in 08? <laughs> I mean, to me, it sounds like 08 was a learning lesson, right? That was, uh, let's see, I think that was advanced real estate 206, right? Uh, it was a three credit course, uh, lasted 10 years, right? Sure. Uh, but, but you know, that's the thing that I, I hear more and more in the voice of experience, you know, that, hey, we've, we've made some pivots, we've looked at the markets, we've seen how they work, we've, you know, and, and what I heard you say is that in 18, you, you pivoted toward recession resistant and you weren't entirely correct, but you weren't wrong on the wrong side. You were wrong on the better side, right? And then you looked at some things you held off for investing for seven months. That could have, you could have looked at that and said, boy, did you guys miss out? However, look at all the deals that you missed that could be going sideways now. Um, and so there's a lot of prudence in that. And that's the one thing that I, that I hear in a common theme with experienced investors on this podcast and, and in other conversations is that we're not in a hurry. You know, we're not, we're not running to take down the deal. We're not throwing our hat in the ring and going, you know, hard money, non-refundable day one and, and, and jumping at these things and going, yes, I can underwrite that at a 2.6 cap because I can magically do things to the market that have never been seen because experience tells us that, you know, and it, it's awesome to hear people with experience both last time it was good and last time, you know, the last time we saw any kind of constriction in the market was 9, 10, and 11. And so um, now that you're focused on this, you, you've used this term recession, recession resistant several times, and you threw out mobile home parks, you threw out uh, self-storage. What does that, what, why are those asset classes in your mind uh, recession resistant? Sure. I mean, there's a couple of reasons I can get into Shannon on, on each asset class. We'll start with mobile home parks. Uh, first, you have the most affordable housing option in the U.S. And so during tough times, uh, recession, economic downturn, we've historically seen the demand for mobile home parks go up. Uh, and in, in addition to that, you have a very uh, limited supply asset class. It's really hard to create, develop, build, new mobile home parks for a lot of reasons. Um, yeah. You might know this as a developer, I'm sure, but uh, we put those two items together. That's uh, often why we consider it to be recession resistant. So you have a, an asset that will remain in high demand uh, during tough times. Now, so really, you've done research. You've looked at what happened the last downturn. You saw how those assets performed. I know that uh, in the last downturn, self-storage was like numero uno, right? I mean, it was it was the best asset class to be in uh, because while people were losing their houses, they weren't losing their stuff. So they had to store that somewhere while they downsized. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of it comes back to supply and demand, right? And how yeah. do they change and adjust during tough times? So the same with storage, you see the demand for storage go up during tough times. People are moving, they're downsizing, they're, 
they're changing something in their life. And when that happens, the demand for storage goes up. And so we got into these asset classes, Shannon, right after the recession in right. 2008, because we saw how they were doing during that time where there wasn't a lot you could point to and say, wow, that's still performing. And so right. we still invest in them today. So when you, I mean, what you've been through this whole downturn, you saw when credit totally dried up, you saw when an over, there was really an oversupply in the market in 08 uh, because everybody gave up their house and moved somewhere else. So we were, you know, we were flush with product. There's not a lot of similarities between then and now. Now we have an interest rate that's climbing. We have prices that escalated because of the lower interest rate. Uh, and so we had some, some growth there. Uh, and now we're trying to bring the interest rate back to the market price, which is causing some friction, but there's still money available. There's still lots of money available. What are you looking forward? What's, what's, what's the Mark Curry 24 month window on what someone should expect uh, with with capital markets and and where you see things going with the affordability product, yeah, you know I'll start with the capital markets, Shannon. Nobody knows, of course. We have a lot of forward guidance from the Fed raising interest rates. Uh, you know, we are in September of 2022, and so there's a lot of uncertainty still. We've experienced rapid interest rate growth over the last you know six months or so, and we're projecting and, and estimating that to continue. And so, capital markets are volatile they're going to remain volatile for the short term. Um, I think at some point, once the Fed reaches its goal and inflation is back to uh, more historically normal levels, we may see that interest rate growth uh, stop and maybe go back down. So we don't know. Um, so the, the, we don't have a crystal ball, but what we know is it's making things harder to pencil. It's making things uh, a lot harder for as far as deal flow to find good investment opportunities. And so we keep coming back to where we see long-term demand, which uh, an affordable housing, Shannon, where, again, as I mentioned before we started talking, we use that a little bit loosely. We think of mobile home parks as affordable. We think of um, typically class B workforce housing in growth markets as an affordable option. And those types of assets you'll see again, during volatile times, demand typically stays very strong, often goes up where people might be downsizing, trying to save some money. Maybe they're paying, you know, 1800 a month for a class A property and they're gonna, you know, move down the road a couple miles and pay 1200 a month for a class B property and that kind of concept. So um, yeah, what questions does that bring? I know I just threw it but out. What, but what part of that, Mark, there's also the argument, I wanna play devil's advocate for just a second because after those last statements, you are incredibly knowledgeable in uh, what you see in the capital markets. Um, but when you see people go, yeah, but it's it's the workforce that's getting crushed because gas is still over $4 a gallon. Uh, chicken has never been higher priced and a gallon of milk is you know over three bucks at my supermarket. So that squeezed them the most where class A, maybe, you know, maybe there's a layoff, but they had some savings. Maybe they're staying in their C-suite job. Um, and maybe they're, maybe they're moving from a class A in Los Angeles to a class A in Reno um, because they can work remotely. What is, what, is your, what is your counter to that? Or what is your, what is your thought process that says, yeah, but... Yeah, I mean, there's so many trends going on, as you noted, some of them, Shannon. So, for example, you know, we've been investing in Phoenix for the last number of years. We've got into Las Vegas in the last two years. We love Texas. And so we're focusing on markets, again, where there's high demand. You have very high net in migration as well, as you kind of alluded to. The number of people moving, for example, from the West Coast, California, to some of these markets I just mentioned, um, is a very steady, attractive trend that we see. And again, we want to benefit from that. A lot of people can work remotely, Shannon, you mentioned it. And so we're seeing that. We're seeing, you know, you can drive from LA to, uh, you know, Vegas and Phoenix and be there in the afternoon, right? And so people right. are doing that, doing that. Thousands of people are doing that uh, regularly. And so what, but what means, uh, follow the trends, right? We're, we're, we're looking for long-term sustainable investments where we think there's going to be uh, a lot of demand and continues to be a lot of demand. And we're always looking at our exit, Shannon, right? So we, we don't invest in office at all. We, we, why? It's because 
I don't think in five to 10 years, there's going to be as many people buying office as today. I think that is going down. So we like to be in asset classes where we think who we're going to sell to that buyer pool is going up. And that, that's been a, a trend of ours and a strategy of ours for many years. Sure. You know, the other thing that you mentioned is you said, you know, deals don't pencil. And, uh, you know, if interest rates continue to rise, uh, as you experienced, there's always sellers. And there's always people that are going to be put in a situation that the continued rising interest rates are going to cause their deal to no longer be affordable for them. So as you're, you know, when you're looking at when you got started in real estate, obviously you got started for cash, but interest rates were in the seven, the eights. When we go back to that, what do you think is going to happen that's going to change why a deal will pencil with a higher interest rate than today that would allow you to purchase it? Yeah, I mean, most likely it's going to be some cap rate compression. That's that's the, the reality of it. Uh, excuse so me. you're still believe expansion not compared. okay yeah i was like yeah. well wait a minute so you believe that we're going to see cap rates expand um you know i was looking at a deal the other day uh they were looking at a five cap on something and the debt was coming at a five and a quarter there's no there's no arbitrage there right so so you're going to see cap rates expand which really for those that are maybe new or or, or don't really understand cap rates that means price goes down that means you're collecting the same amount of rent but your price goes down because your what you're getting on your capital return is an 8% return, which means that you've got to have more of that free cash flow coming to you as the investor rather than to the bank. And so when you're seeing that cap rate or expansion, now you got me saying it, Mark. <laughs> uh, when you see that, that means that you know right now, and we've seen this over the last couple of months, we've seen buyers and sellers be really far apart. Uh, and in the last couple of months, we've seen sellers get a little bit more reasonable, we call it, right? They're just understanding that, you know what, I did make a good return. Uh, and if I do want to sell now, it's going to be at these levels rather than these levels. Um, and there's also going to be that, that, that product that you really kind of cut your teeth on in the market coming back into the market because like we you we discussed uh, prior to pushing the record button there's people that have gotten that uh you know that floater uh three year bridge that they you know are bringing the deal together and they were going to get their takeout financing on a 10 year fixed at 4.5% and they've long passed that for for in debt and so their cash flow is being eroded their investors are starting to question those things where do you see uh from your experience in the world of repos and things like that, do you see that being a, a bigger component in our market moving forward? You're talking about distressed single family, Shannon? Uh, multifamily, distressed multifamily. multifamily. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know, right? We, nobody knows. We haven't seen it yet. And I think right now what we see is there's a lot of uncertainty in buyers' eyes, right? And so... Um, people want to be compensated for the risk, the uncertainty and compensation comes through typically a lower price. And so at some point, there'll be some stabilization in the capital markets, Shannon. We don't know when. And once we get to that point, I think the psychology of the buyer is going to change. Like, okay, now we know for, with, with much more certainty, interest rates are X, cap rates are Y. We can go out and, and run a pro forma and build in assumptions into our financial model that we feel confident about. Today, uh, it's a little bit harder to do that. And so that's where there's this mismatch that you talked about between buyers and sellers. Um, I don't know that there's gonna be a lot of distress for a few, few reasons. One, we've had exorbitant amount of rent growth, okay? It, way beyond anyone's financial modeling projections ever put in, at least anyone with a conservative eye. And so that's still happening, Shannon. In a lot of these markets, we're still seeing robust rent growth. And we're still seeing a lot of premium between an unrenovated unit and a renovated unit. So you can still grow your net operating income very confidently in a lot of these properties. And that helps offset the risk and uh, the underwriting and the analysis. And so we always project a much higher exit cap rate than what we're paying today. We've been doing that for years. 
Right. And, and that's how you can kind of protect your downside. Um, so for me, I, I'm not sure that there'll be a lot of distress because uh, especially in multifamily, you're seeing uh, owners and operators of these assets uh, reaping some of the benefits of higher rents to help offset the risks that we're talking about. Yeah. You know, and, and I think, you know, Mark, you and I've been uh, underwriting at higher than normal cap rates, normal being what people have been doing in the last couple of years for quite some time. I mean, when we build, we build to an eight cap, right? I mean, that's our goal. So we've got timelines, we've got, uh, you know, lumber markets, we've got products and materials that we've got to coordinate. We've got, you know, we've got so many things. I mean, our, our projects are 18 to 36 months long and you have no idea what's going to happen. You know, as we discussed earlier, you know, we've had 9-11, we've had COVID, we've had, you know, uh, the financial crisis of 08, we had... I mean, we've had just all these things that have happened. It's like every time we turn around, there's something, but that's what makes it exciting. But you said something earlier that your investments are boring. How can your investments be boring in a market that's always changing? Yeah, yeah. So we, we like boring, Shannon. Boring to me um, means that we're doing some of the same things over and over because they work. Yeah. And so that's how I use the term. For me, I, I look at 10 to 20 deals a month. We invest in five to seven a year. And right. so what I'm looking for is very specific. And a lot of times, uh, I guess you could say boring because we've done it uh, a lot of times before and we have a much higher likelihood that we're going to be able to continue to do it again. So that's, that's where we look at the, the, the term boring. And you know what? That's the exciting part about it because when you're looking at the 20 deals, you're not trying to relearn oh, you know what, let's look at this type of asset class with this kind of underwriting. It doesn't fit our wheelhouse, but let's get exciting, right? Um, there's other things you do for excitement, like I hear you're a downhill skier. Sure, yeah, yeah, I love it. So, you know, and you, you live in a really horrible place for downhill skiing, don't you? <laughs> yeah, don't come here. There's no snow, yeah. it's not fun. <laughs> Bend, Bend, Oregon is phenomenal. If you guys get a chance to go ski there, go ski there and stop in and see Mark. But you know, Mark, it's, it's always great to hear somebody that's been in the industry. And I, and I have a lot of guests that have been in the industry for a long time. Uh, but it's always nice to hear that some people are ahead of the curves, even if it takes them out of the game for seven months during COVID uh, to, to miss deals, to ensure that the, the investment thesis is held solid. I've watched so many people uh, run headlong into a knife uh, chasing a deal because they, they, they don't want to miss something. And it's really awesome uh, when we get veterans like yourself on the show that have, that have been there and done that. Um, what, is, what is one of the things that you're most uh, pleased with as, as far as you know, what you do in your daily work, uh, in your investment company? What is it that really brings you the most uh, I don't know if I want to call it joy, but satisfaction in what you're doing. Yeah, you know, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm a deal guy, Shannon. I love looking at investment opportunities, number one. It's like maybe a slight addiction that I have, but uh, I'm a financial analyst by trade. I started in finance many years ago. And so maybe that's part of it too, is where I'm constantly comparing and analyzing things. Um, but that's just, you know, internally. So when we get an opportunity and where, where the joy comes, it's like, oh, great, we've got a really exciting deal. I'm really excited to share it with our investors. And, and then they reap the benefit, right? Right now, most of our investors tell me, Mark, I'm looking for capital preservation. I'm looking for some cash flow. You know, let's just, just keep it simple. Let's not lose money, right? Because they're look, comparing it to the stock market. And yeah to crypto and you name, you name it. And so we are able to provide them with an investment option that, uh, you know, meets their needs and they get really happy about it. And so it's kind of a win-win for, for all of us. And that's what, what we like to do every day. You know, and that's, and that's so true. You know, it's funny because we, we did hint on this about the, there's always the new investor, right? The new investor that, that came in in 07, there was a new type of investor that was investing in foreclosures in 09, and they chased that all the way to 17 when there were no more. And, and there's always the new investor, but it is the things that are simple. Uh, and, and, you know, that's, that's why you see guys like, you know, like Warren Buffett, who have done the same thing again and again, and have gotten 
incredibly wealthy. Uh, and Mark has had, Mark, you've had a lot of success just by being repetitive, just by, you know, you're not trying to crush it. You're not looking for a home run every single time. You're looking for affordability. You're looking for uh, high demand. You're looking for reliability of the tenant structure. Um, and uh, it's been a winning proposition for you. Um, and you've you've invested in over a billion dollars in real estate. I mean, that's that's amazing that you've been able to do that with the same boring strategy. Must be something right about what you're doing, my friend. Uh, and uh, congrats on on uh, such a milestone. Thanks, Shannon. Appreciate it. So, guys, I want to thank you for uh, tuning into the Real Estate Rundown, and especially thank you, Mark, for bringing uh, all the knowledge that you brought today. It's it's always refreshing uh, to hear somebody that's been a veteran that survived, um, you know, and uh, continued to bring value to your investors. So, guys, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to the Real Estate Rundown. And if you want to get these podcasts, be sure and click the bell. It'll alert you every time we drop a new one. I'd also love it if you'd leave a review. I'd love to hear back from you. And if you want to know how to get in touch with Mark, you can contact us. Send us an email at connect at shannonrobnet.com. We'll get you in touch with Mark. You can hear more about what he's doing. And uh, as always, Mark, appreciate your time and appreciate you being on the show. My pleasure, Shannon. Thank you. That's a wrap for today's episode of The Real Estate Rundown. Let these newfound strategies pave the way to start a successful career or a profound rebranding. If you loved everything you have heard, listen to more conversations at www.shannonrobnet.com and be sure to leave a rating, share it with your friends, and subscribe. Until the next episode.